A very warm welcome to everyone to this afternoon webinar. I thank you very much for taking your time, your precious time to come on board. And we know and we pray and believe together with you that your time with us will not be a waste, but it will be a blessing to you and to your friends and to the people around you. Now, some housekeeping rules before we kick off the whole event. Uh, remember, please, as you listen to the, our speaker for this afternoon, as if any question that cross your mind, please key them into the chat box, all right? There's, I, if you go below, at the bottom of your screen, you will find, you, you will see the chat box there, the chat screen, just click on it and type it in. Make sure uh, it is um, available to everyone because there's also a private chat that you can only, uh, what you call, write to a certain group, certain people. So make it everyone, make sure that it's to everyone so that we can view it and we can post a question to you. Now, for those of you who would like to ask a question personally after the presentation, please do a shout out or give a sound out or put a head, hands up on your screen and then we will pass them, uh, ask you to come on and you can post a question to the speaker this afternoon. Right, so this basically this is house somehow the house rule, and just make sure that all your microphones are, are mute are muted. And for those of you who are facing slow in Wi-Fi transmission, uh, you, there's one way you can do it to stop the video, and you will hope to speed up your video transmission so they don't have any lag in the in the in the in the what you call yes. in listening to the message. All right, so to kick it off right now, I invite my wife Florence to. Uh, Say a word of prayer before we pass this time to our chairman. Thank you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to commit today's agenda into mm. your great hands. Yes. Open our hearts and ears to receive and to learn what we are going to gain with much understanding, accompanied by the necessary knowledge given to us mm -hmm. with gladness in our hearts. Thank you for blessing us with none other than Dato. Dr. Colin Lee. We are truly so privileged that he's taking this special moment to share some insights of his expertise mm -hmm. in fertility concerning issues and treatment. Amen. We thank you, dear Lord, for this opportunity to allow us to be well-versed with his great input given to us, mm -hmm. surrendering this particular point in time into your precious loving hands. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Now we pass this talk to our chairman, Brother Tan Tik Singh. Yeah, thank you, Richard and uh, Florence, uh, you know, for the opening uh, prayer. Now the, uh, you know, welcome uh, every each and every one of you week after week that you come onto this uh, webinar. And uh, we, this is, I suppose, is our 18th webinar since the, uh, this uh, MCO. And uh, we are so glad that at least, I think thousands of people have actually uh, listen to our weekly program and uh, more so that because our this uh, webinar is also tape recorded and we will also you know uh, produce them into the YouTube and we send it to all the various uh, you know this family first nations and they themselves will also broadcast to all their respective members and so far I think that our this uh, uh, this uh, family first uh, these uh, activities, we have reached out to more than 2 million families in Asia. We are so blessed, you know, that our founder has got the, such a big vision and uh, he wants to see that at least about 100 million people, families, uh, whose families are blessed, you know, through this uh, platform. Now today, in fact, that we have such a, you know, wonderful speaker and, uh, and uh, before I introduce the speaker, I would just like you to just uh, share with you about what, Family First Malaysia is all about, all right? So, media, please go on. Family First Malaysia is a non-profit organization. We serve people regardless of ethnic, religious background, or social status. We practice these seven values that govern our words and actions. We believe every human being is of infinite worth. And the best place to discover this is within the family. We believe that strong, healthy families are the cornerstone of civilization. We believe every family 
can be happier, stronger, and more united. We believe in the power of prayer and the eternal value of every soul. We believe in the power of partnership, that together we can do much, much more than we could ever do on our own. We believe we must always conduct all our operations, partnerships and finances with the highest ethical and moral standards. We believe we must always respect and fully comply with all local and national laws in every jurisdiction in which we operate. Family First Malaysia vision exists to transform next generation fathers, supported by mothers to build better families resulting in a better workplace, a better society and a stronger nation. And our mission is to partner with like-minded organizations to restore, reshape and release men and women to become better couples and parents in the context of original marriage with 3F focus, that is family, finance and also fitness. So this, these are the three pillars of Family First Malaysia that on the better family front, we have all together six modules that covers these better families that in terms of the, uh, this noble family vision, uh, strengthening marriage, and uh, the role of a husband and the role of a wife and intimacy plus parenting. And on the better finance, we have uh, four modules that help our disciples to be able to actually learn how to become a better stewardship in terms of uh, finance. And at the same time, they must also understand God's purpose for money plus how to manage their finance as a couple and also finally on the financial freedom. On the better fitness side, we believe that, you know, if once we are physically, financially uh, healthy, on our, you know, physical side, we must also equip ourselves, you know, mentally as well. So we need to actually have a proper nutrition and also exercise. So in this module, in this particular uh, pillar, we have two modules that actually uh, help our disciples to actually know how to take care of their physical health. In family, we believe that we want to double our love, our joy and peace in our families to restore broken relationships, reshape the home environment and release the next generation leaders using home as the starting point of leadership training. And in terms of finance, we want to double our income on net profit ethically and righteously we value innovation to double our giving. We all bad debt settle and achieving oneness with money as a family, beginning with fathers and mothers to model better financial stewardship. On the fitness side, we want to double our mental and also physical health through cultivation of positive mental attitude, holistic exercise and nutrition, resulting in high energy and wisdom to achieve things of big and lasting impact. Family First Malaysia, you can follow us on this, uh, you know, the website. Uh, please take up your phone and let's scan in, then you can follow us for all the updates and also all our activities. Because every week we run the webinar and we are inviting all those, you know, these, uh, you know, very uh, uh, anointed uh, speakers to come and uh, share with us on the family values and also on the different matters concerning families. Now, our organization, since it's a non-profit organization, we are all running on the pro bono basis. And every single dollar that is given, I mean, that is donated to us, will be properly used in running uh, these uh, family first activities in Malaysia. And uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us in this, uh, you know, uh, uh, webinar, so that we'll be able to continue to journey on together. Mm. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, thank you, media and. Uh...
Today we have, uh, you know, the uh, Dato Dr. Colling is a good friend of mine and, uh, you know, such a busy person, uh, but he's so willing to come on, actually to come and share with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see that next week we have, uh, well, I'll be launching my book from Ayaya to Hallelujah. So uh, please come on and this will be on the special invitations. Uh, I will send them to the respective, uh, uh, each and every one of you, so that you can come on to actually hear our story, All right? Thank you, the media. And of course, Dr. Colling is the, also the founder and the group medical director of Alpha IVF Group. Now, for those of you who do not know what IVF is all about, I think it's intra, uh, this uh, in, 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 in vitro fertilization, right? Uh, he's, a, he's also the world leader in the field of IVF. And uh, he has a huge team, a large team, a team of about 110 staff, which includes about nine IVF specialists and uh, also 27 scientists and 41 nurses and also uh, 33 support and also administration staff. Uh, he's also the co-founder of the Asia Pacific uh, Initiative on Reproduction. Uh, is called Aspire and is an internationally recognized leader and innovator in the field of fertility technologies. And uh, he has actually produced more than a dozen world first in the fields of IVF, genomics, and also stem cells. And I understand that he also has got a stem cell, uh, this uh, you know, science labs uh, based in Melbourne, right? Now these achievements, of course, has actually gained him as the world first successful pregnancy and delivery in a woman born without a vagina and the world's first successful pregnancy and delivery following the PGT and also CGH diagnosis of chromosome. So in, uh, inversion with fresh transfer. I think he's going to explain to us more about some of these technical terms. Now, Dr. Dr. Colling is also the founder and uh, the uh, managing director of the this uh, you know the uh, the uh, Kuala Lumpur Wellness City which is a huge you know medical tourism project that he has embarked on so we certainly want to pray for all his success because he's going to bring the world top class all the medical scientists into that center so without further ado let us welcome Dato Dr Colin to come and share with us Yeah, over to Thank you. Thank you, Brother Texting. And uh, I'm happy to be invited and have the privilege and honor to share on this uh, wonderful platform of Family First. So I'm going to put on the screen now a slideshow, which also includes a couple of videos to explain some of the issues and treatment options in uh, fertility. Okay, first, the definition of uh, infertility, if one is below 35 years old and are not able to conceive after 12 months of regular unprotected intercourse, then it is called infertility. If one is more than 35 years old and is not able to conceive after six months of regular unprotected intercourse, then it is called infertility. And infertility is very common. It now affects as much as 25% of uh, married couples in some countries. Whereas in other countries, it could affect as much as 15% of married couples. The causes of infertility can both be the female or the male. And which one do I go up or down? Okay, in about a third of the cases, the male 
is responsible for the difficulty in getting pregnant and in about a third of cases, it is the female, whereas in about a third, both male and female causes can be identified. If we exhaustively investigate the cause of infertility in a couple, we find that there's still about 5% of couples that we cannot define, that we cannot detect what is the cause of the infertility. Now, just very briefly, this is the female genital tract and this is the womb or the uterus. The entrance at the top of the vagina. So in normal intercourse, sperm is deposited here and the sperm goes up here, goes up the fallopian tube and fertilizes the egg, which is here. The egg is released at ovulation and the fallopian tube will capture the egg and the egg will get fertilized here by the sperm. Later, a video will illustrate this whole process. For women who are aged 35 to 39 years, the chance of conceiving spontaneously is approximately only half of younger women between, 29, between 19 to 20 years old. This time of 19 to 26 years old is actually the peak time for fertility for a woman. For the women who are 35 to 39 years old, the cumulative conception rate is reduced to only 60% at one year and 85% uh, if it is two years. Now, this is very important because uh, the older a person gets, the older a woman gets, the lower is the chance of getting pregnant. This graph represents what happens when a woman gets older. So if you look at the bottom axis, here we have different age groups for women. The youngest one here, 20 to 24 years old. And here, women who are 45 years and above. And you find that fertility rate drops. When we say 475 here for women who are very young at 20 to 24 years old, what it means is that at the end of one year, 475 married women at that age group would have already given birth. If you compare with Women who are 40 to 44 years old, women will give birth. And the number drops drastically to only like about a, uh, 30 per 1,000. Okay, I'm trying to uh, get this thing to work. Okay, got to keep moving, huh? otherwise it keeps disappearing. Okay, now you look at this uh, orange line and we find that uh, spontaneous abortions are relatively rare in women who are much younger. But when a woman who is 45 years and above, you find that 90 over percent of their pregnancies will end up in a miscarriage. Now, this is important to know, and the reason for it is because as one gets older, the eggs become chromosomally abnormal. And the rate of abnormality in eggs for a woman of about 45 years old is more than 95%. Meaning that at 45 years old, out of every 100 eggs that a woman produces, at least 95% will be abnormal. And basically, a abnormal egg is unlikely to result 
in fertilization and if it does it is uh, less likely to result in an implantation and if it implants it is quite likely to result in a miscarriage like here you can see that about 93 percent of uh, pregnancies at 45 years and above ends up in a miscarriage now this is something is important to understand Above 35 years old, there is a significant decline in fertility. And after 40 years old, this decline is accelerated uh, exponentially. And not only that, but the increase in the uh, fertility decline is uh, compounded by the existence of pathologies such as fibroids, endometriosis, and ovulation disorders, and also the chances that a woman would have had surgery affecting the uterus or the ovary would have also increased the older they are. So all these go towards to compound the uh, chances of getting pregnant as a woman gets older, especially above 35 years old. In a man, there are problems uh, that could result in infertility. And here we outline example, if there's no production of sperm, this could be because there is no production of sperm at all in the testes, which we call testicular failure, or there is a obstruction from the release of the sperm, even though the person produces sperm, but the sperm cannot get out of the body. And this one, fortunately, can be treated using a procedure called MESA or PESI, where we can surgically remove the sperm and use IVF to produce a baby. We, men can also have very low sperm count, or they can have sperm which is there, but they are not able to swim, or the shape of the sperm is abnormal, and therefore it cannot result in a penetration of the sperm into the egg. Or there could be difficulties in having sex, such as uh, ED, erectile dysfunction, or ejaculation failure. Okay, I'm now going to play a video on uh, how a uh, normal process of uh, fertilization and pregnancy takes place, and what is in vitro fertilization, or IVF. Dr. Colleen, there's no sound on the video. Still no sound. Okay, then can you hear me? I can hear you. Commentary. We can hear you, but no, no sound on the video. Okay, now you see the egg now makes its way into the uh, Okay, the egg is the largest cell in the body, and uh, there are shells around the egg. So, sperm gets onto the egg. Okay, and Sperm is produced after about 72 days and during incubation, during intercourse, millions of sperm will travel up 
and about 100,000 sperm goes around the egg. So one sperm would go into the egg and fertilize the egg. So the egg is now fertilized and develops, it grows, goes down the fallopian tube and ends in the uterus. And in the uterus, it plants into the wall of the uterus. And it is now called a embryo and a fetus. Okay, this is the corpus luteum which uses progesterone that supports a pregnancy. The pregnancy then grows inside the uterus and eventually a baby is born. In the laboratory, we call that in vitro fertilization, which you look on the right hand side. Okay, injection, which is FSH, is given to the patient. And the purpose of that is to make the ovary produce many eggs. These eggs, when they are big enough, are then aspirated. This then is passed on to the IVF laboratory. And the sperm, which is produced by the husband, is used to fertilize the egg. So this is the process of uh, Insemination. One is just a basic IPF where we put thousands of sperm around the egg, and one of the sperm gets in. Another way, which is done in most situations now, like there was a plan, is that we actually inject sperm into the egg. Protein or ET intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Upon fertilization, the embryo then divides and grows and can be tested for chromosome abnormalities. The embryo is now put into the uterus and the embryo will eventually implant into the wall of the uterus. Implantation process. So millions of babies have now been born using IVF. IVF is generally safe. So IVF has been around now for a generation. So the initial babies born as a result of IVF now conceive and produce babies both. It is envisaged that in the future, the more babies produced by IVF than natural conception itself. I apologize that the uh, video sound did not come out as expected, but I hope that uh, running commentary by myself uh, has helped. So I believe many of you or most of you would have heard about IVF, so that was how it is uh, done. There are many technologies that have uh, progressed over the years, especially in recent years, and I just want to highlight a few of them to showcase that uh, the field of IVF has progressed so much and the pregnancy rates that can be achieved through IVF is now much higher than it was 10 years ago and certainly a lot, lot higher than it was 20 years ago. So amongst the technologies now, Piezo uh, ITC, okay, which I will show you a video later, there are crowd preservation techniques now that achieves 100% of uh, free store, meaning that when an embryo is frozen and then later it is thawed out before it is put into the womb, the cyber survival rate now is uh, can, of 100% can now be achieved. One of the uh, significant uh, improvement is actually the use of time-lapse embryo monitoring, which allows a better culture condition for the embryos to grow and also better selection of the embryos. Basically, all this that we mentioned, the final goal is to increase pregnancy rates. One of the recent uh, advances is the 
a next generation sequencing which is used for pre-implantation genetic testing. Here, I want to tell you what this uh, <coughs> biosoap ITC. ITC stands for intracytoplasmic sperm injection, where a sperm is selected and injected into an egg. So this is what it is like on the right hand side is conventional ITC, and one sperm is injected into the egg. Piezo ITC basically uses a uh, more advanced method where there is less damage into the uh, uh, damage onto the egg when the sperm is introduced into the egg. This is a video to show how a conventional ITC is done. So a sperm is loaded into the needle and the needle is pushed into the egg and that sperm is now unloaded into the egg and we hope for fertilization. In Piezo ITC, which is the video on the right hand side, a sperm is also loaded into the needle and the needle instead of uh, ramping its way into the egg actually has got a certain uh, um, very micro way of uh, hammering and uh, causing less distortion and damage to the egg and after getting into the egg the sperm is then released into the egg. By doing so there's less damage to the egg and also there is a lower degeneration resulting in a higher fertilization rate. Okay, next I want to elaborate is a cryopreservation which is the freezing of the embryo and then thawing it out for later use. It has been found recently that <clears throat> putting the embryo back into the uterus when the uterus has had 11, 12 days of uh, high doses of uh, fertility injections actually causes a reduction in the pregnancy rates. So the way to increase pregnancy rate is not to put the embryo into the stimulated uterus, but to put it in when the uterus is not stimulated. So to achieve that, one has to freeze the embryo and then let the patient have their period and then in the subsequent month or the following month, then only to put the freeze-thaw embryo back into the uterus. This has been shown clearly to improve pregnancy rates provided, provided that the freezing process does not damage the embryo. So now there is a method where the freezing and thawing of the embryos can achieve 100% survival rate. And this goes a long way in helping to increase the final outcome of IVF, which is increasing the pregnancy rates. Time-lapse embryo monitoring is a way of uh, monitoring a, the growth of the embryo so that we can select the best embryo for transfer, resulting in a higher pregnancy rates. But not only that, it also creates a better environment so that <coughs> the embryo can achieve its highest potential. Here, I will show you a video of a uh, time lapse, and you just concentrate on the top <coughs> top second from the right embryo. Okay, you notice that fertilization has occurred. Now the cells are dividing here. Okay, these are twelve embryos that we are monitoring at the same time. So you can see that the embryo. <coughs> Is growing. The top second one from the left <clears throat> and now it has divided and has become what we call a blastocyst and blastocyst is the way forward to achieving the highest possible pregnancy rate. So modern IVF centers now uh, in order to maximize pregnancy rates, we'll always go for a blastocyst culture and a blastocyst transfer program. Day three and day two embryo transfer is a thing of the past and uh, should not be done anymore. 
one of the recent uh, advances in uh, IVF is the use of pre-implantation genetic testing. We know that the majority of embryos has chromosome abnormalities. So if we transfer embryos without testing the chromosomes, we are basically subjecting the patient <coughs> to lower implantation rates, lower pregnancy rates, and higher miscarriage rates, and also a higher risk of delivering abnormal babies such as Down syndrome. With pre-implantation genetic testing, we can test the chromosomes of the embryo, which is, we call it aneuploidy. Aneuploidy, an example, is Down syndrome. And not only Down syndrome, there are thousands and thousands of different kinds of uh, aneuploidies. In fact, the permutation is probably go into the millions. Uh, however, the one that people understand the best is the Down syndrome. So we can test this even before the embryo is decided whether we need to transfer the embryo uh, or whether we should not transfer the embryo. Now, PGTM, M stands for monogenic disorders. These are things like thalassemia, cystic fibrosis, and so on. And uh, we can test the embryo so that uh, the patient will not end up having thalassemia major or having a uh, very bad uh, consequences in their pregnancy. Then there's this thing called uh, PGT structural rearrangements, <coughs> where we can test for things like translocation, inversion, which causes low pregnancies and also high miscarriage rates. So by testing this, we can actually solve uh, some couples' problems who have recurrent miscarriages or who can't even get pregnant at all. <coughs> The last box here talks about pre-implantation testing of the uh, HLA, which uh, this is used in a thing we call a savior sibling program, where if a child has got a thalassemia major and is uh, meant to die at the age of uh, 15 to 18 years old, that the next child uh, that is going to be born we can avoid that child going to suffer from the same fate. But not only that, the child can also uh, be able to be not just born, but the caught blood that is, uh, uh, that is taken from this younger child can be used to do a bone marrow transplantation into the elder sibling and to save the elder sibling from certain death. We actually have uh, such a case coming uh, next month. Okay, with all these technologies, today the new gold standard is uh, a, we aim to get blastulation rates in the region of 70 something to 80%, implantation rates that is touching 80%, clinical pregnancy rates that is now exceeding 80%, and a cryopreservation preservation pre-store survival rates of 100%. So these are the new gold standards in IVF. You can say that this is very, very different compared to not only 10 years ago, but even five years ago, these are rates that would be unimaginable. So today, IVF has gone a long way that we can achieve such rates in good cases. So how is it that uh, pregnancy rates can be maximized in uh, IVF? It's actually a long process. IVF is not a procedure. IVF is not a method. IVF is not a process. IVF is actually a program. It is a program that involves many processes. It involves many techniques. It involves many procedures. It is a long process starting from the time the patient walks into the doctor's room to the time that a pregnancy becomes stable. So if this diagram illustrates the various numerous, numerous components, both in the clinic, in the IVF laboratory, it involves personnel from the doctor to the nurses, to the embryologists, to the scientists, to the geneticists, and so on. So it is a program. It is a very complicated program that is best handled by people who are highly skillful. So uh, with that, I will... Uh, 
I finish my talk, I know that this is a very, very broad area and uh, there are many, many uh, areas, many, many sub-areas that we can cover. However, what I've done is basically to give a platform for Q&A so that uh, we can address uh, questions that, would, uh, that you have. All right. Yep. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Colleen. Um, this is a very, very interesting subject, which I really no idea what it's all about. <laughs> and he's very professional in it. Uh, but there are some questions being posed, and uh, my wife will uh, present the question to you so that uh, we see it, and we'll hope that it will be a blessing to the others. What happens to those frozen embryos if the couple decide not to have any more babies? Okay, this is a very good question, and in fact, this is the biggest ethical issue that uh, I feel is in the field of IVF. We know we have many ethical issues like surrogacy, egg donation, and uh, you know so many so many ethical issues that uh, people bring up. But I feel that the biggest issue is the one that you have just brought up, which is what happens now to the millions and millions of our embryos that have been produced over the years and are now sitting in nitrogen cryogenic tanks all over the world and they are not going to be implanted into the uterus. So what's going to happen to them? So it depends in uh, which country the jurisdiction is. In Malaysia, example, the uh, Guidelines from the uh, Ministry of Health specifies that after five years, you are supposed to take it out of the liquid nitrogen and let it meet its natural fate. If you want to continue for more than five years, then you're supposed to write in to, to the Ministry of Health for permission and then you can keep for a further period of time. In some other countries, there's no such regulations and uh, basically it can be kept there indefinitely. Now the question is this. If you were to take these embryos out of the liquid nitrogen, it is going to, it will not uh, survive anymore. So basically it is going to expire. So are we then creating embryos and uh, is it ethical to create embryos that will never see the, uh, not given a chance to become uh, a, a baby? So this is a question that has been raised uh, again and again. And I look at it this way. In, if we understand the normal physiological process, now you think back of the uh, earlier part of our slide and the early part of the video that uh, was shown, you will see that there are many uh, embryos that are formed inside the bodies of uh, women and these embryos do not end up becoming babies. Meaning that a embryo that is formed in the fallopian tube, which goes down the fallopian tube, some of them get stuck in the fallopian tube, they don't implant, so they actually aspire. Okay, or they implant and then they miscarry, or sometimes they go down and then they get go out through the cervix. So this is happening by the thousands, if not the millions, every month around the world. It is a very natural process for embryos to be formed and then not to become babies or not given a chance to become babies. To me, I see that uh, IVF is just an extension of that process, not happening in the body, but happening in the laboratory. And I feel that this is not a, uh, a difficult uh, ethical issue to address. This is my view. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, Dr. Colin, could you... Uh Close down your share screen so that uh, we can see the others on the screen. Before we continue. All right, thank you very much. Another Hi. question. Uh, wait, wait uh, there's one more. There's some more question coming in. 
is this trend globally prominent or only in Asia? So, fertility rate of uh, couples around the world has dropped precipitously. To give you an example, fertility from men, just only 25 to 30 years ago, which is just one generation ago, the WHO defines a low sperm count as anything below 60 million sperm per cc of semen. 60, yeah, the number below. Around, uh, around uh, about 20 years ago, it is found that if we use that criteria, then the majority of men would be defined as having low sperm count. So what happens is WHO lower the limit, the cutoff point from 60 to 40, 40, empat puluh. So below 40 is now stated as low sperm count. Then around 12, 15 years ago, they found that at 40 million per cc, most men will not qualify. So they dropped the standard further to 15, 1, 5, 5 plus now. Okay, so you see that in just a span of one generation, WHO has lowered the standard from 60 to 40 to 15. Now, this is actually quite alarming. That whatever is happening, whether you blame it on the environment, the food, the lifestyle, or whatever it is, the sperm count of men has dropped incredibly just only in the, in the last 25 years itself. If you extrapolate this to another one generation, frankly, it's a bit scary to think what sperm counts are going to be like in the future. So this is just an example of uh, fertility potential dropping precipitously in men. In women, uh, one of the uh, a uh, trend that causes fertility to drop is that women are getting married late. And even if they get married not so late, a high proportion of women are postponing starting a family so that when they actually start trying, they are actually much more elderly. And as uh, shown in our earlier slides, that uh, the fertility potential of women drops exponentially once they cross the mid-30s. So couple with their lifestyle and uh, married couples having uh, less intimate relationships uh, nowadays compared to say 50 years ago, uh, especially less in urban people compared to the rural people, so on. So the trend is uh, that uh, fertility potential amongst couples has dropped a lot uh, over the last several decades. And this drop is particularly prominent in urban areas, mm. less so in the rural areas. So as the world heads further and further into urbanization, you find that uh, fertility rates will continue to drop. Okay. Now, right. this is the lowering of fertility rates. On the other hand, and uh, this is by the mercy of God, there is now technology, and this is where nature fails, science takes over. And this is where IVF came into the picture. IVF was in, invented uh, in, uh, a, in animals in the 1950s, and then it came into humans in the mid-1970s. And today, there are... Uh, IVF is uh, all over the world now, and basically this is uh, a getting sperm and eggs to meet, culturing them in the laboratory and putting it back into the uterus. And the pregnancy rate, the success rate from IVF has grown tremendously in, uh, say, 1990 worldwide. Pregnancy rates you are looking at uh, below 10% from IVF. Now, don't think 10% is low because naturally, for the patients who need to go for IVF, their pregnancy rate may only be 2% or 1%, and IVF increases it to 8 or 
Now, this is 1990. Today, as you can see, pregnancy rates can be as high as 50 something, 60 something, 70 something percent. In uh, IVF uh, centers, which are not so good, even the lousy IVF centers, you can get 20 something, 30 something percent. Whereas the top IVF centers, you can get 50 something, 60 something percent. Mm -hmm. So uh, you see, nature is crumbling when it comes to fertility rates. And this is where science, in a very timely manner, is coming onto the scene. And this is where, again, we say, where nature fails, science takes over. Uh -huh. So from the, the Christian perspective, I think this is where a, uh, I think uh, IVF is uh, given by God to help to address uh, the uh, decline in fertility, which is pro uh, probably caused by the uh, negligence of uh, men in the way they treat their environment and the way they treat their lifestyle and uh, in the way that uh, they postpone uh, what is uh, more meant to be, which is that uh, women should uh, get pregnant when they are younger. And this is what the physiology of uh, women is supposed to be, that they should get pregnant at the peak of our fertility, which is meant to be from a 19 to 20 something years old. And not like a lot of women now trying to get pregnant only when they are in their 30s or worse, some of them in their late 30s, early 40s. Mm -hmm. wow. wow. Thank you so much. Um, I think my wife and I made the right choice when we got married <laughs> at age 25. <laughs> <laughs> nice question. Yeah. What will it cost for couples to undergo this program from conception and delivery? Okay, the, I would like to look at it this way. How much does a IVF cost from the time that a couple embark on the IVF program to the time that they are diagnosed to be pregnant. Okay. Once they are pregnant, the treatment is similar to people who get pregnant uh, naturally. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that one has got its own cost. And if one were to register with a, uh, uh, a public hospital, then it costs you one ringgit. That's not a visit, right? Whereas uh, they are talking about IVF. So the IVF treatment program itself, there are many chip packages going around uh, outside and it can be as low as even about 11,000 ringgit for the program. And there are also uh, programs that has got all the high-end technologies like those that I mentioned earlier. And that could cost as much as about 40,000 for one cycle. And of course, uh, the uh, pregnancy chances in general the uh, higher end packages, which includes all the higher spec technology, will result in a higher pregnancy rates. But of course, there's also differences uh, in terms of uh, cost and uh, success rates between different centers and between different uh, doctors. So IVF is a very skill dependent uh, process, which uh, has got very different results at the end. Mm -hmm. The cost of an IVF program must not be seen as a uh, how much it costs to do a cycle. It must be measured against uh, what is uh, the likely result. Example, if we go to the supermarket to buy some uh, soap powder, a, it doesn't mean that a packet that costs 10 ringgit is cheaper than a packet that costs 50 ringgit. Because for 10 ringgit, you may be getting a, let's say, half a kg. Whereas a 50 ringgit one, you may get a one whole box of, uh, of 100 kg. So uh, the measurement of the success and uh, whether a, a treatment is cheap or not should be measured against what is the cost per baby take home. So example, if one go to some, example, some government centers where it's heavily subsidized, and one maybe just pay 8,000 ringgit, but the chance of taking home a baby is only 5%, then mm. the effective cost per baby is 8,000 times 20, which is actually 160,000 ringgit just to have one baby. Wow. Whereas going to a center that is very effective, it may cost, say, 30,000 ringgit, 
but the chance of taking back a baby is 50%, then in effect, it's only costing 60,000 ringgit to have a baby compared to the government department that you think is cheap, but at the end, it's actually a lot more expensive. So the concept of cost per baby is an important concept. Right. That's a good way of looking at it, true. Uh, there's the next question that's been posed. It says, uh, what is the percentage of deformity from this program? Okay, the chance of getting a, what we call a congenital abnormality, meaning when a child is born and has some kind of deformity. First, let's look at the baseline. The baseline over the years is 4%, meaning that uh, out of 100 women who give birth, or, or rather out of 100 babies that are born, four will have abnormalities. So the abnormalities basically is uh, divided into three types of abnormalities. Okay, now we get the right frame of mind first. A child is born. At the time of birth, the child has an abnormality. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are three types. The first type is what we call chromosome abnormality, meaning that the abnormality results from a chromosome base. Example is a Down syndrome. The second group of abnormalities are what we call genetic abnormalities. Now, people tend to confuse congenital abnormality and genetic abnormality. A person, a baby born with a congenital abnormality means abnormality at birth is not necessarily from a genetic condition. Only one third is due to a genetic condition. The best example that people can relate to is thalassemia, which is very common amongst, say, the Chinese or Southeast Asia. So thalassemia is a genetic abnormality, but basically, most of the time, people are not aware because they, are, they still live a fairly normal life. Then there's one third of our abnormalities, which are what we call acquired abnormalities. Example is, if a mother contracts rubella in early pregnancy, the child may born with a vision problem. Okay, so these are called acquired abnormalities. Or the child contracts HIV when the mother is pregnant and the child is born with a HIV. Now, this is called a acquired abnormality. So there are three types. So when it comes to a patient that goes to IVF, the chances of a abnormality compared with a spontaneous uh, pregnancy is actually about the same. However, a patient that goes to an IVF program that has a pre-implantation genetic testing done, then you can eliminate the chromosome abnormality problem and perhaps even the genetic problem if the test is done for that purpose. Meaning that overall, the latest method of doing IVF that incorporates the pre-implantation genetic testing actually results overall in a lower congenital abnormality rate compared to the normal population. All right. Is it possible for a 44 years old woman to be pregnant using IVF program? Yes, it is. What is the successful rate? Okay, first of all, we have to look at the background. If you remember the chart, I think the second or third slide, or third or fourth slide that I show, it shows that uh, a woman, a woman at 44 years old, the chance of uh, getting a pregnancy, number one, is extremely low. And if she gets pregnant, then 90 something percent of the time she will get a miscarriage. Oh, and yes. miscarriages often are not even recognized. Example, a woman who has regular periods, then they find that one of the periods is funny. It is somehow a bit different. It may be late by a few days, and then it's different in some ways. But because it is not that different, she probably just ignore it. It could just be a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. And what is the cause of the miscarriage? Almost invariably, it is because of a chromosome abnormality. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So you have to look at uh, the baseline. So the baseline at a 44-year-old to deliver, to produce and deliver a normal healthy baby is extremely low. It is less than 0.1% okay, per month of trying. Wow. Whereas if you do an IVF and if you don't test the chromosomes in the embryo, you can, at 44 years old, achieve pregnancy rates of as high as even 12-15%. Mm. And remember, 12-15% is extremely high because your background is only very low, less than 1%. Next, next you've got to look at it is this. If you don't test the embryo in IVF, huh? in IVF, if you don't test the embryo for chromosome abnormalities and just transfer the embryo without testing, you are going to get a high pregnancy rate like 12%, but most of it is going to miscarry. And miscarriage has got its own problems because uh, you've got to clean, there's complication, you delay your next chance by another few months and so on. So in order to test whether the embryo is normal or not, you do a thing called pre-implantation genetic testing. And if it is abnormal, you don't transfer because you know you're not going to get a successful, uh, healthy, normal baby. So you don't transfer. And unfortunately, at 44 years old, in the first place, the majority of patients will not even have a embryo that is chromosomally normal that is available for transfer. Mm -hmm. So the chance of having such a healthy embryo for transfer is low. It is going to be less than 20%. But if such an embryo is available and you transfer, then the chance of a pregnancy becomes significantly higher than you can look at in the region of about 25%. Okay, so in general, at 44 years old, Naturally, to get a normal healthy baby, you're looking at like 0.1% kind of level. Whereas for an IVF, you could then increase that percentage to something between 5 to 8%. All right, good. Yeah, there's another question being posed. Can a, can a woman do IVF program after menopause? You can, but uh, you need to understand, uh, first of all, uh, you notice that uh, all my answers come with, a, I will make sure that you understand the background, then you will appreciate the answer. So the background again is this. When it says menopause means that she's not producing any more uh, eggs. Right? Meaning that uh, if she wants to get pregnant, you need to have an egg donation, meaning that uh, the eggs have to come from a, uh, a donor, uh, which may or may not be related. Usually it's unrelated. Usually it is uh, what we call an anonymous uh, egg donor program, where the eggs of the donor usually is from someone who is 19 to 25 years old, is fertilized with the husband, and uh, the resulting embryo is then implanted into that postmenopausal woman's womb, and then she will carry the baby and deliver the baby. So this is called a third-party reproduction, where the genetic material comes 50% from the husband, slightly less than 50% is actually from the donor, and probably a little bit some maybe one percent is from the uh, from the wife, but the wife carries the baby, and the wife delivers the baby. In the eyes of the law, the one who delivers is the mother. It is undisputed, and no one can take that away. Okay, so this is uh, what we call third-party uh, reproduction. I can tell you again, if you like, uh, some biblical uh, basis for uh, for that. All right, next one. Uh, someone who just uh, would like to know concerning this matter, there's a renowned gynae, Dr. Tao Xianghua, former dean of NUS, was, the, uh, was his senior pastor. 
He says like, not for IVF as if we are playing God to insert someone else's sperm into another egg, etc., etc. This is not natural, but man-made. Dr. Colin, what do you say as a Christian doctor? And this Dr. Tao just passed on at 95. Hmm. Okay, can I have, uh, can you repeat the statement that he says again? Um, we are. It's just like it says that we are playing God to insert someone else's sperm into another egg. This is not natural, but man-made. Okay, uh, let's make it clear that uh, this, is, this is not IVF. Huh? This is talking about a uh, artificial insemination or insemination by a sperm donor. So this is talking about sperm donation. It's not talking about IVF. I think you've got to be clear about that. Uh, so this statement does not address the issue of, uh, it's, it's not talking about IVF, it's talking about sperm donation. Okay. Uh, firstly, before I comment on that statement, uh, I will give you my views. Uh, uh, but before that, uh, I would like to pay tribute to uh, uh, Dr. Tou Xiang Hua. Uh, allow me, give me a few minutes. I really want to pay tribute to this uh, giant of a man a man of God, and a role model for me to uh, follow as well. Now, Tu Xiang Hua is, a, is, is a, uh, the successor to uh, President Shears. You know, President Shears was the second, a, uh, second president of uh, Singapore. Do you know that he was a gynecologist? Wow. Uh, Dr. Chi Wing Yu, Chi Wing Chi. You know? So, he, he was the... Uh, Head of department of uh, the ONG department in uh, Kandang Kerbau Hospital, which at that time was, uh, was becoming famous. And we have to thank all of us uh, who uh, benefit from uh, gynecologists in Malaysia, got to thank it to this fellow, because he was the man who brought the uh, official training of gynecologists in Singapore and therefore Malaysia, because those days, Malaysia don't have uh, uh, university. You've got to go down to Singapore, right? Uh, before they split, and then uh, we got Malaysia and Singapore. Like people like Mahathir was uh, Tou Xiang Hua's, uh, I think, classmate, nah, right? Uh, in medical school. So they, um, he brought the official training of gynecologists into Singapore and therefore Malaysia. So his, his influence uh, is actually tremendous. Thanks to him, today I'm a gynecologist as well. Otherwise, mm -hmm. if he, did, he didn't do that, we got to go all the way to UK and spend years there to become a gynecologist. So he brought the training of gynecologists to Malaysia and Singapore to localize it here under the auspices of the London College. So he was a great man in that respect. Few people recognized that this was a great uh, contribution. After that, he, he, he set up his Young clinic and then he went into, uh, initially not full-time, but later full-time. He still practiced gynecology, but most of his time was spent to, uh, in God's kingdom. He uh, was a close friend of my uh, grandmother's mother. Uh, uh, he had some link with uh, Batu Pahat, that's my hometown that I come from. And uh, his father, in fact, was a Batu Pahat person. Uh, and also, uh, but I'm not sure how much time he spent in Batu Pahat. And close family friend, and uh, he actually wrote for me calligraphy, the Lord's Prayer in Mandarin, which I learned from, uh, as a kid from my grandmother, I recited in Teochew, even though the word is in Chinese, right? But I recite in Teochew. He has calligraphy, which I have, I put it, in my bedroom, and somehow I bring it to my consultation room, which is an uh, inspiration to me. So, Tu Xianghua was a successor is SS Ratnam, who was my mentor. And under SS Ratnam, and if there's no Tu Xianghua, there's no SS Ratnam. And SS Ratnam actually brought uh, the field of gynecology in Singapore to great heights. And in the time that I was with SS Ratnam, we invented the first microinjection baby which is uh, earlier I mentioned about uh, HC, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. The precursor of that was invented by us when we were in Singapore, by Singaporeans and Malaysians together, we did that. 
And uh, so we actually led the work in uh, IVF uh, in, in, in the time that uh, I was under Ratna. So Do Xiang Hua is a great inspiration. I respect him greatly. Uh, I met him only once in my life uh, when he came up to Kuala Lumpur to uh, the uh, Bible Calvary Presbyterian Church in uh, Section 16, PJ. And I, I remember that short time that I, I met him. So he's a great man. Certainly, whatever he says to be respected. Now I come back to his comment uh, about uh, sperm donation. I feel that uh, views about such thing is, uh, may have a cultural uh, basis for it. Uh. And uh, example, is, I do not know his comment about IDF, uh, but I believe that he, he, he accepts IDF. Uh, even though I never had a chance to, to, to know about his views. But uh, the third party reproduction involving sperm donation, if you go back to the Bible, I, there is a cultural basis. What do I mean by that? If you look at the Jewish custom, that uh, if a man dies and the wife does not have a child yet, it is the duty of his brother to impregnate the widow. Okay. And in fact, if the man does not do it, as in the case of Onan, he was struck dead by God. How severe the punishment is, you see. So to me, you see, and, and, and those days, it was a, uh, you have to do it through a, what today we will call it an adultery. All right. Uh, but today, a donor does not even have to go near, don't even know who the recipient is. It is done through technology, okay? Social distancing there, okay? <laughs> right. And uh, frankly, I think there is a place for third-party reproduction, sperm donation in this case. Yeah. So this, this is my view, and I don't think it is uh, biblically unsound. Amen. All right. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Well, I didn't know that uh, Malaysians and Singaporeans are, are, are leading in this field. Fantastic. Now, mm -hmm. someone commented that this program seems to give the couple more babies in one go that can cause stress to them on how to handle more than two babies at a time, I guess, talk about twins. Appreciate your assurance to the strong couple who may just want one or not more than two babies. Okay, I understand uh, how this comment comes about. And uh, I would like to address it, uh, I think, very easily to be addressed. There were days, uh, like uh, 10 years ago, uh, worse still, 20 years ago, when pregnancy rates were not as good as what it is today. So if we look at, let's say, 20 years ago, in the year 2000, we have to put in two embryos, even three embryos, in order to give the patient a good chance of a pregnancy, a good chance, like a 40% chance, a 45% chance, perhaps. To achieve that kind of chance, we have to put in two or three embryos. When you put in two or three embryos, quite often you end up getting twins or even triplets. And occasionally, when one of the babies split into two, you add in one more. <laughs> so those days are gone. Okay, today in top IVF centers, you don't put in two embryos anymore. Three is a no-no. So you only need to put in one. And when you put in one, you already can achieve pregnancy rates of 60-something and 70-something percent. There's no need to put in two anymore. However, you need all this advanced technology that I mentioned earlier. If we don't make use of these advanced technologies, example, we go for a low-cost but efficient IVF program costing, let's say, 14, 15,000 ringgit, then you need to compensate the reduction in fertility potential, uh, fertility success rate by putting one more embryo. So you put in two. But when you put in two, yes, you increase the pregnancy rate perhaps from 32% to 50%. However, if a patient gets pregnant, the chance of twins becomes about 50-55% of twins. So this is a balance between what the patient can afford and what 
are the consequences. Consequences of twins is that there is a about a sevenfold increase in things like uh, like uh, preterm labor, meaning that the babies are born much uh, earlier and therefore may have problems associated with uh, immature organ systems mm. by the eye, the heart, the lungs. So these are complications that can occur when people have twins compared to singleton. It doesn't mean singleton, there are no complications. But twins versus singleton, the complication rate is sevenfold. Triplets, of course, the complication rate shoots up very high. So today, uh, the answer to that question is, we put in one if the patient can afford going to all the high-end treatment, but if she needs to go for a, a low-cost, efficient system, then you can still put in one, but you have to understand the pregnancy rates are not as great. You can have a higher pregnancy rate by putting in two, but there's a possibility, in fact, a high, high possibility, you end up with twins and the consequent a, a higher complication rate. Mm. So how some people look at it is this. You see, all this has got to be seen in the uh, social economic environment of a country. Example, uh, in Malaysia, if you go for an IVF treatment, you can go to a government department. Okay. You may not pay a lot, but the pregnancy rates are very bad. So at the end, you actually pay a lot more. So you go to the private sector. So when you go to the private sector and you have to fork out your own money, now, okay, you can withdraw money from the EPF account too, but it takes your own money. You should use it for your housing, your retirement, and so on. So basically, you've got to take money out from your own pocket. However, if you get pregnant, you can have your pregnancy done in the government hospitals and any complication from the financial aspect, the financial support aspect is all paid by the government. So this is important considerations. There is in Malaysia and the US similar. You want to do IVF, you go private sector, it's from your own pocket. But when you have a complication, of our pregnancy and delivery, you go to the government sector, which is virtually free. So it, it, it is important. These are some people say, no, no, you should not consider money as fair or thing, but let's be frank. People have limited financial resources, so they have to look at what is available in the healthcare system. So unfortunately, this is the reality. So there are people who say, no, doctor, this is all I have. This is all the money I have. Give me the highest chance. I don't mind getting facing the consequences of higher complication because of twins. In fact, I only have 15,000 ringgit. If I get twins, I pay 15,000 ringgit, I get a bonus. <laughs> yeah. So, so every, every couple has got a different perspective. And uh, as a doctor, we see where they're coming from. We try to help them to manage uh, the expectations and the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, affordability and so on. Example, if there's someone at the C-suite level, they come, you know, for them, they want the highest pregnancy rate, they don't mind paying a lot of money because for them, time cost is a very important thing. Then they go for a high end, they pay triple of the low end, the pregnancy rate is not tripled, but the pregnancy rate is perhaps increased by another Instead of, uh, let's say, 50%, now goes up to 70%. But they pay three times the price. Okay, so these are, the, to give you some insight on the social economic aspects of uh, IVF treatment. All right, thank you so much. Someone would like to know, is it possible to use IVF, a light program, to keep dead body for next generation, return to life, invention? Sorry, uh, IVF as a what program? A light program. Some sort of like a light program, to, uh, a like program, something a similar program to keep oh, okay. the next generation uh, return okay. to life. Cryopreservation, actually, uh, we, we can cryopreserve, meaning that we can freeze something and then mm. we thaw it again without mm. damaging or without significant damage to what you freeze. Now, currently, the technology is effective against a finite number of cells. 
So how it works is this. It's done through a process called vitrification or rapid cooling. So this rapid cooling occurs uh, drop down to minus 196 degrees Celsius within a period of a fraction of a second. Okay. Now, for that to happen, it means that the liquid nitrogen has got to penetrate the tissue that you're going to freeze. So, what does that mean? It means that the more layers of cells for the liquid nitrogen, the cooling effect to take place, the slower will be the speed. Mm. So if you were to freeze the whole body, that's not possible because uh, by the time the liquid, uh, the uh, coldness goes into the inner parts of the cell, there's really too much damage has already been done. Mm. Okay. Uh, they are, they are so, so basically at the moment, this crowd preservation uh, process works only for small number of cells. The blastocyst example has got uh, as much as 100 over cells. And the efficiency, the uh, what we call the survival rate is 100%. Okay. However, if you move on to something like uh, 1,000 cells or 2,000 cells, then I'm not aware of anything that can give anything close to 100% survival at this stage in time. So the answer to your question, simple answer is no. It is not available today. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Someone would like to know. I had IVF with Dr. Tan last year with failed result. I had an appointment with Dr. Colin on March, but was automatically cancelled because of Malaysia lockdown. Is it possible for me to do another IVF program? Yes, it is open now. Uh, Ministry of Health has allowed uh, IVF to be open again. In fact, uh, there was a, uh, a period, a short period that just closed. But as early as I think June, I think uh, it was open again. Okay. There's another question. After two years getting married and age is 29, approaching 30, would you recommend IVF program yet or suggest to wait and keep trying? After marrying, what, what year? At what She's old? How old? Two years after okay. two years of marriage. Okay, after two years, certainly, I think you need to go for a assessment. Uh, the first assessment is just to see whether there's uh, any obvious uh, problem, and depending on the problem, then uh, some may need intervention, some may just require more time. Some could be very simple, some very simple, uh, taking uh, tablets costing sixty ringgit, and uh, just that. Can, can help them to get pregnant. So the assessment is important. No two couples are alike. Okay. Um, there's someone who asked this, but uh, we will post on the separate, uh, different way. So what I need to do is, uh, I'm going to read them uh, one, one after another, so they just wait for a while, okay? Now the first part is that my daughter went for first consult in Kuala Lumpur, but saw Dr. Leong, uh, not, not this is from, uh, uh, okay, my daughter went for first consult in Kuala Lumpur, but saw Dr. Leong, but because of COVID, she underwent IVF under Dr. Tan in Singapore. Now with twins, in about 16, her, 16 weeks. In her 16 weeks, it is detected discordant, only to confirm their size at 20th week. Uh, are they safe? Are they in safe situation? Uh, they are what? Discordant, eh? Yeah, yeah. discordant. Okay, I am not sure exactly what she meant by that. Uh, uh, I think I think that one has to be uh, has to be assessed uh, on its own merit. So I can't comment unless I get uh, proper information okay. about. What, what she explained further was one of the twins is smaller, growing in weight, called discordant weight. Both these okay, think... twins are in different uh, sex. sex. One day, if there will be complications. Okay, based on uh, the information that you have given me, of course, uh, this to me is still not sufficient information. But uh, based on the information that I'm given uh, just in the last two minutes, it means that uh, the 
it is a twins that resulted from one embryo. So uh, this embryo has split into two at a particular stage. And uh, therefore, there is a what we call a twin-to-twin -twin transfusion. Now, again, I want to qualify that this is based on the information that is supplied to me in the last two minutes. So uh, if the information is not quite bad, then whatever I say would, may not be valid. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in a twin-to-twin -twin transfusion, uh, the twins has to be monitored very closely. And uh, I, I know Dr. Tan of uh, Singapore, I think Tan Heng Hao, if, uh, if that's the one, I think he's very competent in uh, handling this. And uh, the, uh, basically, there will be monitoring to see how the two twins are growing. And there may be a stage where a intervention like the form of an early delivery may have to be instituted. Mm -hmm. So you are saying that they are now at 16 weeks, 1-6? Yeah, 1-6. Yes. Okay, so 1-6, there is still a long way to go. But certainly, this is what we call a high-risk pregnancy. And uh, uh, I believe that Dr. Tan would also be handling this, uh, perhaps in conjunction with a fetal maternal uh, specialist. Uh, and I, what I can say is that uh, she is in good hands. All right. Thank you. I hope that answers your question, whoever that posed that question. Uh, there's one more here that says that, Alpha can accept patient from Indonesia now because she's, I consult Alpha nurse and marketing said still closed. So now, unfortunately, it is not uh, whether Alpha or any other fertility centre can or cannot accept. This is uh, coming from higher authorities, which are basically the borders are still closed. Uh, there okay. is a, a, they can come on a certain a program, but it has to be a... Uh, uh, allowed by the uh, Ministry of Health and there is a quarantine process that will have to take place. Even coming uh, may require like a private chat or a chartered flight or something like that. So for the moment uh, from Indonesia, which is still considered a red zone country, mm. uh, I, it is actually not allowed. All but right. from China and certain green zone countries, yes, it is allowed, but there are uh, certain strict uh, logistics and SOPs that will need to be followed. Very true. Very true. Thank you so much, Dr. Colleen. Um, uh, is there any more other question anybody would like to ask before I pass this time back to the chairman? And uh, yeah. Uh, I, I personally would like to ask a question. How long does uh, uh, the sperm stay active? in the sperm bomb, uh, sorry, sperm bank. sperm bank. It is actually the one, a couple that I know of, that uh, the husband had uh, the sperm put in the sperm bank for about nine years now. Mm. Still okay. The freezing process, basically there are three parts. Whether you freeze sperm, you freeze egg, you freeze embryo, or you freeze blastocyst, basically there are three parts. The first part is the freezing. The second part is the storage. And the third part is the thawing. Mm. Okay. So let's go to each part. Whether the sperm or the egg or the embryo will survive or whether it will be weakened or damaged usually happens either in the first or the last part. The freezing process or the thawing process is where the hazards are. In the intermediate period, which is the, the uh, storage part, it is stored in minus 196 degrees of uh, nitrogen, and it is a stage where the sperm has got zero metabolism. So basically, it is in a state of uh, dormancy where nothing happens. As long as the liquid nitrogen stays liquid and there is no disruption, to that environment, which usually there would not be, unless, uh, unless due to some uh, issue, the uh, laboratory forgot to top up the liquid nitrogen or there's a leak, there's a fire or whatever. Now, liquid nitrogen is very stable and uh, the sperm can stay there indefinitely. So theoretically, whether it is there for nine months, nine years or 90 years, nothing happens. Okay. There's no deterioration. 
thank you so much <laughs> no we don't want to thank you for this uh, very in fact truthful uh, meeting and also that a uh, very informative uh, talk on the fertility the issues and also the treatment by our doctor Colin. And we know a lot that you have sent him on this webinar and this webinar we also reach out to many thousands of people who may not be able to come on this webinar but they will also be able to even listen through the YouTubes. We want Amen. to thank you a lot for his contribution. We want to thank you for his willingness to come on and also despite the busyness of his schedule, he has indeed invested time to come and share with us these mm. valuable lessons, you know, in fact, to also uh, benefit those who want to know more about this IPF. We thank you for this day. Thank you for his life and thank you, let Lord, that he continue, Lord, to use his expertise and also be able to use uh, these uh, wonderful techniques to even produce healthy and beautiful children for your glory. We want to thank you, the Lord, that of course, we do not want to play God, but we know that, Lord, that you have indeed given uh, our doctor calling the skills, so mm -hmm. that he using the skills to be able to treat it. You know, we know that, Lord, creation comes from you, but you still require uh, the specialist to come and also do the proper treatment. We want to thank you for his life. Thank you for Karen. The Lord, thank you for this wonderful family. Then may you continue, Lord, to bless him for the many, many this uh, endeavor that he's going to embark on. And we know the Lord that he has his desire is to see that the uh, to be able to bring in all the top specialists around the world to wow. even congregate in Malaysia to build up a Kuala Lumpur wellness city for your glory. And we know the Lord that it is not by might, by not by by strength but by the power of your Holy Spirit that you can to lead him and also guide him. So thank you, Lord, for this wonderful talk. Thank you, the Lord, that for your hand upon uh, our this brother calling, that continue to strengthen him, bless him. He is indeed highly honoured, greatly blessed, and deeply loved by you. Give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.